Let's open with prayer. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this day and um, for calling us here together to be around your work. Though it's raining and kind of messy outside, Lord, we thank you for this safe, sheltered place, Lord, uh, where we can uh, and concentrate on, on the words that have been set for us. Um, we, we lift up in prayer, Lord, those that, that aren't so fortunate and just ask that you will bless them and, and show us how maybe we can uh, we can help them in their situation and bring them closer to you. Uh, be with us as we as we study together, Lord, and lead us in the direction you want us to go. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so today's October the 11th. We're going to talk about Philip today. Uh, this sort of was a reminder. We talked about why Acts might be uh, an important book to study uh, in, in the climate that the church finds itself in today. We, we spent a little bit of time talking about what the Bible is, what the Bible is not. Uh, we, we took a look at some of the things that the early church in Jerusalem actually did, how they were devoted to one another, how they shared with one another, how they spent time together every day worshiping, praying, and, uh, and honoring God. Last week we talked about Stephen, uh, one of the early deacons of the church, and how he became the, the first, the, the word that's usually used is martyr. It's really interesting that the word that is translated martyr in some places in the New Testament is the same word that is translated witnesses. All right, so in the early Greek, in the Greek language of the New Testament church, the same word for witnesses is the same word for martyr, who gives their life for the church. So it's, it's all part and parcel of the same idea. Next week we're going to talk about uh, the guy named Saul. Uh, our sermon today is actually going to focus on uh, a more powerful incident in Saul's life. 25th, we're not going to have class. Melissa and I are going to be out of town. You are free to meet. I just will not be here. When we come back on November the 1st, we're going to talk about Peter. We're going to spend some time talking about some of these folks we read about in Acts. Uh, on November the 8th, we're going to talk about everybody in the church's favorite subject, and that is change, and what in the world that has to do with the New Testament book of Acts. All right, and we're going to come back and talk about uh, Paul, who I'm sure most of you are aware of, is the same person as Saul. And we're going to talk a little bit about the name change and what's that, what that's all about and his relationship with this guy named Barnabas. Uh, we're going to take a tour of the Greek city of Ephesus, and then we're going to come back to Jerusalem and talk about the last part of of what we read about Paul in, in Acts. Uh, if you remember, Acts actually lays out its own outline uh, in, in, chapter, in verse 8 of chapter 1. Uh, in Acts, verse, uh, chapters 1 through 7 actually are set in Jerusalem. Uh, chapters 8 through 12 are in Judea and Samaria. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, after uh, Acts 12 and following is actually going out to the, the ends of the earth. Or for New Testament Christianity, the ends of the known earth. It's what part of the earth they actually knew about. There were parts of the world they had no conception of. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Uh, today we're actually in Acts chapter 8. So we have, we're going to venture out from the city of Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. And our objectives today, we're going to outline Philip's mission in Samaria. Uh, and then we're going to explore just a little bit about Philip's interaction with this official from a place called Ethiopia and, and what that's all about. So those are my two objectives for today. Uh, if you come up with others, uh, please feel, feel free to do that. All right, so Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. I'm just going to read this real quick, uh, and then we're going to unpack it just a little bit. So uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. That day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. 
and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women, and he committed them to prison. All right, so a couple of things here uh, in, this, in these three verses from Acts chapter 8. It uh, starts out by saying there was a severe persecution. All right, so if you kind of dig into the background of that, that phrase, severe persecution, in the original language, uh, it's uh, the phrase diagmos megas. All right, and it literally means a great hunt to bring a person down like an animal. All right, so if you kind of get back into the original Greek language, that's sort of the, the image that Luke is painting here. There's this, this actual man hunt, woman hunt uh, for anybody who is following Jesus. Uh, and they're trying to suppress and punish their convictions. All right, so this isn't just, you know, doing a few uh, things to make their lives uneasy or un uncomfortable. They're trying to, they're trying to make their lives miserable and, and do things uh, to make them wish they weren't doing what they were doing. All right, and if you come on down in Acts uh, 8, 1 through 3, you see specifically that Luke tells us that they go out into the countryside, into Judea and Samaria. And if you go back into the outline of Acts, when Jesus is giving his apostles their instructions, he says they're going to go into Judea and Samaria. And so that's what's happening. And so that's where we are right now. And Luke gives us the clue that, that is in fact what's going on uh, in, in this part of Acts. All right, so then he says that, that they are ravaging the church. All right, and the, the Greek phrase here, here is elementato tain ecclesia. All right, ravaging the church. And if you look kind of closely at that first word, elementato, might actually start to hear the English word eliminate, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of right there. Uh, it's from the Greek root, lumeinomai, uh, which literally means to affix a stigma to, to dishonor, to defile, to treat shamefully, to ravage, to devastate, to ruin. All right, so once again here, Luke is telling us that this is not just a matter of, of making followers of Jesus' life uncomfortable or disoriented. They are trying to get rid of them. All right. So uh, sort of keep that in your mind. The other word in this phrase is the word ekklesion, which is from the Greek root ekklesia, which everywhere in the New Testament it appears, it is translated church okay now when we 21st century americans hear the word church there are a lot of different images that come to mind all right one of the chief things that comes into our minds is a building right so you know i'm going to go to church we're going to meet at the church will you come to church with me i'm going to church Right? The word ekklesia is actually from two smaller Greek words that have been put together. Uh, the stem ek, which means out, okay, and the verb kaleo, which means to call. All right, so the word ekklesia in the original Greek literally means the called out ones. Okay, and if you start to think about that, uh, in, in the New Testament, when they, when they use the word, when the, when the writers use the word ecclesia, they are always talking about an assembly or a congregation. The word church in the New Testament is never, ever used to refer to a building or a place. It's always used to 
talk about people. All right, so when we say we are going to church, or it's time to go to church, or we have a meeting at church, we're actually not using that word the way it was originally intended to be used. Okay, the church is people. People gathered together worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir? I have a, a question. We, we keep saying they, they, they. Okay, up in the, in the presentation so far, we keep using the word they, pronoun. Who who are the they that, that's doing all of this, all of these problems that for them? Who are causing the problems, or who are being who are being have, having the problems run to them? No, I know who the who the, who the problems are. are who are, who is having the problems done to them? But I want to know what segment of, of people is causing that. It, it's the established Jewish re religious hierarchy. So it's, the, so it's the Jews like in Jerusalem. Yeah, uh, more specifically it is the leaders of the Jewish religion. Like it is the same folks who did it to Jesus. The high priest. Okay. Uh, the, the sect of the Pharisees the sect of the Sadducees. All the people who are the established religious leaders in Jerusalem are specifically the ones who are causing and leading all the problems. Now there are probably members of just the regular Jewish society who are following along in the lead, but it's all being instigated by the leadership of the Jewish religion. Okay, thank you. So that's the, when, I, when I talk about the they who are doing it, yeah, that's, right. that's specifically. Okay, I, I, and, and one of, and if you go back, let's see, if you go back to the Acts 8, it specifically refers to Saul. Okay, so yeah. this is, remember we talked about Luke's foreshadowing where he'll introduce a character at one point and somewhere else in Acts. He'll kind of expand on that character. Well, this is like the second or third time that Luke has mentioned this guy named Saul. Or he hadn't really talked, said anything about him other than, you know, he, he stood by holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. And the instigators of that, if you remember back to chapter 6, were, were people from the synagogue, what was called the synagogue of the freedmen. They're the ones that, mm -hmm. that launched that persecution against Stephen. But then they hauled him in front of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was a group of 70 Jewish leaders who mm -hmm. had been sort of selected to represent the Jews in right. the temple in Jerusalem. Okay. So where were we here? here. So Philip, Philip is one of these who, who goes out. Philip. Uh, if you remember, if you go back to Acts chapter 6, uh, there was a list of the, seven, the first seven deacons in the church. Stephen is the one we read about last week. Uh, Philip, his name appears in this list of seven. Right, So it's the same Philip here in Acts 6 that was referred to, uh, or, or in Acts chapter 8, which was introduced way back in Acts chapter 7. All right, so he goes down to Samaria. Right, that's specifically in the text where it says Philip goes down to Samaria. Uh, and there are lots of places in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, where it talks about people going up and people going down. All right, so what in the world is that all about? So here are, here, here are a couple of maps. Of, of what traditionally is referred to as the Holy Land. Uh, this one on the right is from Google Earth. And I don't know if you've ever spent any time on Google Earth. You can, you can waste a couple of days on Google Earth just searching different places. You can, you can zoom at, out and get views of the Earth like a satellite. You can, you can actually see people's houses. I've actually like found my parents' house in the middle of Tennessee on Google Earth. It's really 
really a great computer program. But this is the Holy Land. These are both pictures of roughly the same area. So right here, this blue here, we've got the, the eastern uh, part of the Mediterranean Sea. Over here you see the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, way up here, uh, the city of Tiberias, which is right on the, what we, uh, we, we tend to call it the Sea of Galilee. The Bible has all sorts of different names for it. It's the Lake of Tiberias, Lake Kinneret. Kinneret is actually the Hebrew word for heart because the, the lake is actually roughly shaped like a human heart, and they actually call it the heart-shaped lake, Lake Kinneret. So here's the Sea of Galilee on this map, the Jordan River flowing down, you can kind of see the valley uh, of the Jordan River, and then the Dead Sea here and here. You notice that it, it looks considerably different on the two maps. That's because actually the Dead Sea is drying up. There, uh, can, uh, modern, Israel is using the water from the Jordan River to irrigate some of the valleys uh, in the northern part of Israel, and they're actually draining out the water from the Sea of Gal uh, or from the Dead Sea. Anyway, uh, so what's up with this going up, going down? Well, if you uh, if you see the, the the city of Tel Aviv right here is right on the Mediterranean coast, it's roughly sea level. Okay, this is the city of Jerusalem. And I kind of I, I put this in here uh, just so I could remember the numbers. The city of Jerusalem is 2,474 feet above sea level. This is this is about 50 miles or so. All right, when you leave Tel Aviv and you drive to Jerusalem, you are actually going up in elevation almost 2,500 feet, okay? The Dead Sea, the, the coast of the, the shore of the Dead Sea, it's really just a big salt lake is what it is, uh, is, is about 20 miles from Jerusalem. When you leave Jerusalem and go to the Dead Sea, uh, you're going from 2,474 feet above sea level to 1,411 feet below sea level. All right, so that's an in 20 miles, about 20 miles, that's an elevation change of about 3,000 feet, right? And it's, it's literally almost straight down. All right, so when you're going to Jerusalem from just about anywhere in the Holy Land, you're literally going uphill. And when you leave Jerusalem from just about anywhere in the Holy Land, you're literally going downhill. So even though this region of Samaria, Samaria is both a town and a region, this region here, roughly this region around here, uh, was uh, the region of Samaria. Uh, even though it's north on the map, and, and when we think about up, down, right, left on the map, we think about north, east, south, and west, right? Well, even though it's north, and you might think you go up to Samaria, you literally, geographically, geologically, have to go downhill, right? More importantly, uh, the city of Jerusalem at the time was where God's temple was. Okay, and in the ancient Jewish mindset, the temple in Jerusalem was where heaven, not, not the sky, but heaven, where God is, met earth. So heaven and earth came together in the temple in Jerusalem. And in the cosmic geography of ancient first century Jews, Jerusalem was the highest point of anywhere on earth. Now, you know, in reality, it's not, okay, but in their, in their cosmic geography, you know, the way they thought of heaven and earth, the temple in Jerusalem was the highest point of anywhere on earth, theologically. And so if you were going to Jerusalem, you were literally going up to the place where God is, and if you were leaving Jerusalem, you were going down, away from God. Okay, so in the cosmic geography of first century Israelites, that was their mindset. And so Philip goes from Jerusalem to Samaria. He's going 
down, both literally and theologically. And then there's all sorts of other stuff wrapped up in this region of Samaria. That's a whole other class that we're not going to get into. All right, so he goes down to Samaria and he proclaims Jesus as the Messiah. The crowd listens, okay, uh, which, which also gets into some other uh, really deep uh, biblical theology where crowds actually listen. If you remember, Jesus, when he's t talking to his own people, says he preaches in parables because even though they have ears, they will not listen. And yet these Samaritans, who, uh, if you know anything about biblical history, aren't really considered to be Jewish people. They're closely related to Jewish people, but they're not Jewish. They actually listen, okay? They see signs. Philip is able to perform signs. Unclean spirits come out, okay? So he is, he is mimicking things that we read about in the Gospels about Jesus. All right, so these first disciples are actually reproducing the same kinds of things that Jesus is doing. The thing about it is, you know, Jesus always gave credit to his heavenly Father, and these disciples are giving credit to Jesus. They're never taking the credit for themselves. Paralyzed, the lame, the, the lame walk, you know, the acceptable year of the Lord is being proclaimed in, in Luke chapter 4, which is a quotation from Isaiah the prophet. And there was great joy. All right, so all these wonderful things are happening in Samaria. And then we get introduced to this guy called Simon the Magician. All right, Simon the Magician is, is this guy that everybody thinks is great because he's got them convinced that he's got some sort of of tie-in, direct tie-in with God, and he's somebody that's really, really important. Well, he realizes, and when all these people see that he's not really as great as he has held himself out to be, he gets baptized. So he's part of this crowd, and he gets baptized. Uh, Peter and John come to check it out. Peter and John, uh, we, they're, they're part of the original apostles. All right, they come down from Jerusalem just to check everything out that's going on. Uh, they laid hands, they received the Holy Spirit, and, and even more wonderful things are happening. So Simon sees all this that's going on, and he says, I want to get in on this deal. And so he, he offers them money to be part of this whole thing about laying on hands and imparting the Holy Spirit. All right, so he wants to buy his way into the kingdom of heaven. All right. Anybody ever heard of people with that kind of mindset before? You think they can buy the stairway to heaven, right? For all you Led Zeppelin fans. Uh, Peter just won't have anything to do with him and says, you know, may your money perish with you. Uh, Simon asked them to pray for him. He doesn't ever volunteer to pray for himself. Uh, he just is really doesn't get what is going on. And Peter and John return back to Jerusalem. <coughs> this big story here that you know people hear, they get baptized, they join the church, but not everybody gets it, right? If you go back earlier in Acts, there's that awful story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you remember that, when they sell this piece of property and they give a chunk of money to the church and they say, they tell the apostles, especially Peter, that the money they're giving to the church is, is was the total amount of the sale of the property. But they held some of it back. And so Peter says, you know, well, when the property was yours, it belonged to you. And when you sold it, what you had belonged to you. And you were free to do with it whatever you wanted to do. Uh, you could have given it all to the church. You could have given part of it to the church and kept some of it for yourself. But you lied about it. Okay, so they did. They, they just don't really get it. And so there's this sort of tension 
between all this wonderful thing that the, all these wonderful things that the Holy Spirit is doing and these people that have an opportunity to be part of it, but they just don't get it. And, and they think they can they can use their position, they can use their wealth, they can use you know their their earthly uh, earthly resources to buy special status within the kingdom of heaven. And it doesn't work that way. Alright. So then we get this uh, we get this story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Alright, so it says, then the angel, this was after they get done with all this stuff in up in Samaria. The angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down, we're going down from Jerusalem again, to Gaza. This is the wilderness road. So just a little bit of orientation, again, back to our our side-by-side -side map. So here is Samaria, where all of these activities that Philip has been involved in, Peter and John come, so they come from Jerusalem down to Samaria, our Google version here, here's Jerusalem, uh, here's Samaria. Well, Gaza uh, was part of the ancient Philistine kingdom on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's way down here to the southwest, right on the coast of the Mediterranean, roughly in this area here. So Philip leaves Samaria, travels south, and then the wilderness road, the desert road, in, in the Middle East, uh, the wilderness areas aren't what we as Americans traditionally consider wilderness. Or at least, you know, when, when I hear the word wilderness, I think untamed forests, right, with trees and scrub brush and, and all that kind of stuff. In the Middle East, all right, they don't have that kind of terrain. Uh, and so wilderness and desert, if you think more in terms of desert, that's what wilderness means uh, for, for a Middle Eastern. So this is the wilderness road, and it, it was a, a well-traveled road. All right, people went back and forth on it every day. Uh, so Philip goes down on the road, he's going down to Gaza, and while he's going, uh, he meets this Ethiopian eunuch who was a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury, and he had come to worship in Jerusalem. Okay, so this Ethiopian, and, and, and you know, when you think Ethiopian in the Bible, you can think in your head, you know, roughly the area that is the contemporary country of Ethiopia in Africa is roughly the same place, but not exactly with the exact boundaries and borders, but it's roughly the same geographical place. So he had made a journey all the way from Eastern Africa up through the Nile Valley and into Israel and into Jerusalem to worship. All right, so here we go. Lightning speed. He's an Ethiopian, all right, uh, or an Abyssinian. The, the Greek phrase is atheops, and it is literally, a, it is an ethnic term, and it refers to somebody's skin color. All right, so when Philip uses, or when, when Luke uses that word, he has a specific image in mind, but it has no derogatory meaning in the first century whatsoever. It's just the description of somebody's skin color. Okay. But he, he puts that in there to let us know that he is from Africa. Okay? Uh, he's a eunuch. There's the Greek word, and it means just exactly what you think that it means. All right, so enough said about that. He is a court official of the Candace. Court official is the Greek word dynastes, which is where we get our English word dynasty. Okay? Same root. Uh, he's a ruler, he's a potentate, he's a member of the he's, he's an important person in Ethiopia. All right, the Candice or Candace is the Greek phrase, 
uh, was the dynastic name for the queens of the Ethiopians or the Abys in Abyssinia. All right, so some people, some Bible scholars, want to equate the Candace that we read about in Acts 8 with the Queen of Sheba that met Solomon way back in the Old Testament times in the book of 1 Kings, right? It's not the same person. It's not, they don't have anything to do with one another. Uh, if you look, this is Israel's way up here. This is the Arabian Peninsula. This is the modern country of Yemen. And most Bible scholars say that the ancient kingdom of Sheba is roughly the contemporary country of Yemen. All right? On the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, Ethiopia is over here on the other side of the Red Sea. Two different places. Okay? Just, just a sideline. He's reading Isaiah 53, uh, part of one of Isaiah's suffering servant songs. And he asked, is, is he writing uh, about himself or about somebody else? And that gives Philip the opening to talk about how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament teaching about the Messiah. And so he asked, look, here's some water. Can I be baptized? And so they get down out of the chariot. They, they went down into the water and Philip was baptized. Now, uh, there, there's this whole concept of, of baptism, what it is, what it isn't, how much water do you have to use, what parts of your body need to be in the water, what parts of your body can't be in the water, how much water needs to be used in order for somebody to be, quote unquote, properly baptized. And I've had people raise the concern that this phrase went down into the water means that they got out of the chariot and they went down into this pool of water all the way down, total immersion, and therefore if we're going to get baptized, we have to be immersed because that's the way they did it in the Bible. All right, well, geologically speaking, there is very little difference between what the Holy Land looks like today and what it looked like in Jesus' day. Now, there have been some changes. A lot of the changes are because of what people have done and, and not what time and erosion and geology has done. If you go today along the same road that was the Wilderness Road when Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch were together, this is what you see. This is a picture of the Wilderness Road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, and it was a major highway in the first century. Right? That's what it looks like. Uh, another picture, of, another view, another sort of different view of the same picture. Are you, you notice anything that's absent from these pictures? Yeah, no water. There is absolutely no water at all anywhere. Right? These are all pictures of that same road, different different locations. All right, and, and not much has changed, right? So it, the water that they went down into couldn't have been much more than a mud puddle, right? All right, so just kind of, you know, when, when you think about baptism, what it is and what it isn't, all right? As Presbyterians, we believe in, in, in our baptismal creed that it's a sign and seal of our engrafted into Christ. All right, we believe in all kinds of different, all different kinds of baptisms. Right, I, I, I have myself baptized someone in the Jordan River, which is a really moving experience. The thing is that it's not the same part of the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. Okay, and the part of the Jordan River where Jesus baptized is about ankle deep. All right, it was probably maybe maybe it was about waist deep back in Jesus' day. Maybe probably not even that much. All right, so so when you get into like theological discussions about what baptism is and what it isn't, uh, we've already seen this one guy who got baptized and then thought he could buy his way into the kingdom of heaven. This Simon the magician, right? All right, so. <clears throat> It, the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians, Colossians talks, talks, ha, talks about how baptism 
basically is the Christian version of Old Testament circumcision. Right? The, only, the biggest difference is that anybody can get baptized. You know, only only less, less than half the population can get circumcised, right? Uh, but in Old Testament Israel, circumcision was your initiation into the, 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 the people of God, into the nation of Israel. All right. Was it a guarantee of anything? I mean, were, were, were all of the circumcised Israelites perfectly in line with what God wanted for the nation of Israel? Or any of them. <laughs> All the time. Alright. So if, if baptism is the Christian version of circumcision, uh, it is our sign and seal of our engrafting into Christ. Alright. Is everybody who ever gets baptized guaranteed from here on out and forevermore? that they will always be perfectly in line with the will of God. Okay. So at, at, there, there are some people, and, and, and I think, you know, it, it's a trap that's very easy to fall into, you know, that once you get baptized, you have in some way earned your position into heaven. It doesn't matter what you do the rest of your life. Just kind of do whatever you want and you've been baptized. Okay. On, on the other hand, you know, once you're baptized, you, you can't, it doesn't give you license to just do whatever you want to. But at the same time, do, does it mean that you have to feel guilty and that you don't have a spot in heaven if you make mistakes? Okay. It, it gives you the reassurance that you're a part of this thing we call the ecclesia of Jesus, the church of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. Right? And we can then be about the work God has given us without having to get all wrapped up around the axle every time we make a mistake. But we can't just assume that because we've been baptized, we can just do whatever we want. God has work for us to do, has put us in a, in a position to do that work. Yes, sir? Is that the Mediterranean Sea in the background? No, that's just the sky. No, no, way back here? Yeah. That's just the sky. That's the horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably like uh, the, the heat barrage. You know, you can see the, the heat waves coming up out well, of the desert. Did they have a in the sea? I'm sure they did, but there's no, there, there's not, not that's come to my mind in the Bible where they ever used the Mediterranean to baptize people. But that doesn't mean they did it. There's just no biblical record of it. Now, how did those people travel on that road? Most of them walked. Yeah. That's a lot of walk. Well, I mean, you know, a horse in the Middle East of the first century was, was kind of a Learjet today. You know, you had to be really rich to own a horse. And especially, you know, if you had a horse that was pulling any kind of car or buggy or carriage. All right, so then the Holy Spirit smacks Philip away uh, I used to you think about that in terms of kind of like the old Star Trek movie where, you know, they would say, beam me out the sky and beams would carry them from one place to some place else. I really, in, in my reading and study, think that, uh, that Philip was just so overcome by the Holy Spirit, he felt compelled to go somewhere else, not that the Spirit actually zapped him from one place to another. Now, I'm not saying that couldn't happen, but I, you know, I don't think that that's exactly what Luke was trying to tell us. Uh, and he found himself in Azotus and proclaimed the good news uh, to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And so if you go back to a little sort of a bigger version, so here's Samaria, he comes down to Gaza, 
it goes over to Azotus, up the Mediterranean Sea, proclaiming the gospel, and in Caesarea, and later on in Acts, I'll, I'll point it out when we get there, Paul will actually spend a little bit of time uh, in Philip's house in Samaria. So this was where Philip would have made his home in Caesarea. All right, so that brings us to the end. Uh, I think I've gone over a little bit again. Uh, any quick questions for me? If not, I can leave Carrie to answer any kind of questions you might have with her. I'm going to go ahead and say a quick prayer and we'll be done. Thank you, God, for this wonderful time. Uh, be with us as we go to worship, Lord, so that we can, uh, we can focus on you and uh, discover a little bit more about what it means to be your church here in this place. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.